following is a video presentation of a worship service at Orville Baptist Church. We do celebrate Jesus as we welcome each other in the name of the Lord and the house of the Lord. We are glad you are here, and here we are on Labor Day weekend. I know some of our folks are out, but we're grateful that you are here as we worship and exalt our Lord. And those joining us online, thank you so much for joining us as we honor and celebrate Jesus. That's why we gather in his name to exalt him. And by doing so, you and I should be able to say when we leave this place, I was glad when I came to the house of the Lord. I hope that when you leave today on this Labor Day weekend, you'll be able to say that with all your heart and then share that good news to people around you wherever you go. Well, we're going to pray together. We've had a uh, uh, a lot of things going on this week. Many of you, of course, uh, some of you which uh, attended the service yesterday, our Chief Burris, a longtime member of this church and well-respected member of our community, served our country and community, and certainly as a police officer for a number of years. I can't remember exactly, 40-some, 40 46 years, and of which 13 he was chief. And... Now he is seeing the, the real chief, the chief shepherd. He's made it home. And we want to pray for Doris when we come to the conclusion of our service for our prayer time. And there are many others, and we'll give you some updates uh, when we have our time of prayer. But let's go ahead and pray together. And uh, heads about, eyes closed, and surrender this service to the Lord. Father, we do join together in prayer. Uh, through the Holy Spirit, in the name of Jesus, unto the Father, prayer on behalf of so many requests that are in our bulletin and that are on our hearts that remain unspoken. You know the needs in our community, in our country, our church, and in our lives. And today, we again want to say thank you for the privilege of uh, being able to come together freely and worship you, corporate worship. We know we are in challenging times as a nation. As we celebrate the Labor Day weekend, we ask for your protection and safety upon each and every member of this church as we go about uh, really appreciating the holiday and help us, Lord, to be thankful for this country in spite of her flaws. 
that we have a country where we can have these type of holidays. And uh, as I said, Lord, in prayer, we are challenging, uh, we are challenged uh, in these difficult days and ask for your wisdom and revival, revival in our church, in our community, in our personal uh, lives, that we would be revived. And as we think in terms of what constitutes a church, our beliefs, and what we value and in going into this new, brand new series of messages entitled Core Values. Speak to us about those foundational truths that have governed and guided this church 122 years and will continue to guide her in the future. And so may this service bring glory to your name, edify the saints, and reach those who are lost. We pray this in Christ's name and all God's people said, and amen. And if you can, stand with me. And we're looking at the book of Acts. Stand for the reading of God's word. And this is the text that I'll be preaching from this morning. Message number one on core values. A message entitled The Church. Look at it with me in Acts chapter 2, beginning at verse 41. And it should be on the screen. Those who accepted the message, his message, were baptized. And about 3,000 were added to their number that day. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. And everyone was filled with awe and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. Selling their possessions and goods they gave to anyone as he had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their numbers daily those who were being saved. Well, remain standing. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. And we'll, we'll drill down into this passage of scripture in just a moment as we look at core value number one, the church. Good singing, by the way. Don't stop now. Keep it up as Lennon comes and continues to lead us. Amen. If you remain standing, let's sing, We Bring the Sacrifice of Praise.
choir as I get ready to bring this message the first of nine messages in this series called core values my prayer is this may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight O Lord my strength and Redeemer that's my prayer for me and my prayer hopefully you will be praying. Here's a good prayer. As I prepare and speak, you ought to be able every Sunday to say, Lord, my prayer is as a preacher is preaching your word. Give me ears to hear 
what the Spirit is saying. And I think that would be a wonderful prayer, both for your part and my part. Here we are, shifting gears now from the Revi series to what I call core values. And as I said, there are nine of them that we're going to look at, beginning with the first one today. I want you to understand the importance of this message to begin this series with, because... As we look at this, I want us to look at core value number one, the church. And we read from that text of scripture in Acts chapter 2, and that really gives us some great insight to the pattern and makeup of the church and the organization of the church. Now, with that being said, let me tell you some things the church should not be. The church is not a social institution. We got social clubs and social institutes all around America and across the world. We are more than a social gathering. We are not necessarily an education institution, although we understand the role of education and discipleship and the classes we teach in Sunday school, small groups, understand that. But we, are, uh, the church, is not an education institution, nor is it a political institution. And I think today in the modern church, we have so many people that really un misunderstand the role and makeup of the church. I will tell you this, we have seen this increasingly so, and perhaps some of you who are watching online maybe have attended a church like this, and you say, let me, let me find out what I want out of a church. The problem is, in many churches in modern-day America, the church is made up of people who are looking for entertainment. They want, a, they want a church that looks like and acts like and blends in with the world. Now, there's a rationale for that, albeit not all of them have this rationale. The rationale that I have seen over the years is that there are those pastors and churches who say, well, you've got to look like them, you need to talk like them, and do things like the culture in order to reach the culture. But may I say to you, the church that the Lord Jesus founded and instituted, he never wanted the church to blend in. And if you're looking for a church, those who are watching online or maybe hear about Orville Church, you, you think we need to blend in. I got news for you that Jesus never wanted the church to blend in. By the way, the Bible says Jesus had come out from among them. Be separate. Now, with that being said, we're not to be on the other end of the spectrum. We're not to be, quote, holier than thou, judgmental, and looking down our noses on people in the world. But the truth of the matter is, the church is the only institution that is a living, breathing, organized organism. The church is alive. And the reason why she is alive is because Jesus is alive and he's the head of the church. And so it's very critical as we think about starting this series out on core values, we understand the purpose of the church, his church. And here's a question I would ask this morning as we begin. How would you want people, when they visit Orville Baptist Church, how would you like people to describe our church? What do people say as to who we are? What, what do we want them to see when they come here on Sunday morning? Well, what do we want them to hear? Or experience and feel. You know, it was years ago I heard a rather humorous illustration. Perhaps you're familiar with it and heard it before. But uh, it certainly bears repeating for this sermon today. The illustration of a, a story about an elderly lady who was very cultured and refined. And she and her husband were looking to take their RV and go on a little vacation to Florida. And so as they were planning the week's vacation, she wrote a letter to the campground where they were going to visit. And so she wanted to know whether or not that this campground was fully equipped. And particularly, 
she wanted to know, as she wrote this letter, about the toilet facilities. But being that such a refined, dignified, cultured lady, she was embarrassed to write the word toilet. And so she got to thinking, what can I call the toilet? And she thought about it. And in deliberation, she finally came up with the term bathroom commode. And then she said, you know what? That doesn't sound right either. And so she rewrote the letter to this campground director. And instead of putting the word bathroom commode, she just abbreviated. She said, B.C. Tell me about your B.C. And she sent the letter off and the campground director got the letter and he just really couldn't figure out what in the world she was talking about, B.C. So he circulates the letter among the employees, said, you know what this lady is talking about in this letter? What in the world, B.C.? None of them had a clue. And then they got to thinking and said, I think she's making an inquiry about the nearest location of B.C., Baptist Church. And so he sends the following reply. See whether or not you think this is humorous. Dear Mrs. Smith, I regret the delay in answering your letter, but I now take the pleasure of informing you a BC is located nine miles north of the campground and is capable of seating 250 people at one time. It's located in a beautiful pine grove and is open only on Sundays and Wednesdays. <laughs> I admit it's quite a distance away if you're in the habit of going regularly, but no doubt you will be pleased to know that many people take their lunch along and make a day of it. <laughs> in fact, they usually arrive early and stay late. <laughs> My daughter met her husband in the B.C. <laughs> Sometimes it's so crowded, they're, they're, they're five to a seat. <laughs> it may interest you to know that right now there is a supper plan to raise money to buy more seats. They're going to hold it in the basement of the B.C. It pains me very much not to be able to go more regularly, but it is surely not due to a lack of desire on my part. As we grow older, it seems to be more of an effort, particularly in cold weather. If you decide to come to our campground, perhaps I could go with you the first time, and we can go together, and I'll sit with you and introduce you to all the others. We will be sure to get a seat up front where you can be seen by everyone. Remember, we are a friendly community. Sincerely, the campground director. Oh, wow. What a description, huh? <laughs> well, what, what describes churches? Uh, what describes Oroville Baptist Church? Well, I want to point out this morning, we need to go back, not just beyond 122 years, and talk about Orville Baptist Church in this community and what we believe, we've got to go way back to the early church. Because the ingredients of the early church, the description of the early church outlined here in Acts chapter 2, there are really four things that stand out in our text that I want us to look at this morning. You've got your outline, follow along. The outline also will be on the screen. But these are the same four things that should be evident on any given Sunday when a person comes to this church. And we're going to look at these this morning because I believe that for 122 years, these have been uh, evident and manifested and demonstrated in the life of Orbable Baptist Church. All of our pastors, those who've occupied this pulpit, and the congregation and staff members, they believe these four things. And these are the same four things that happened in the early church. All right, number one. Are you ready? Nod your head this way if you are. All right, here we go. Then we're going to take off. Here is uh, the four things we're going to look at. Number one, I want us to think in terms of a church that, number one, does what? Preaches the Word. Now you see the little background there. I put one of my favorite preachers of all time that if anyone was true to the word, it was Billy Graham. And it wasn't his personality, but it was his commitment to God's word. One of the things that impressed me so much about Billy Graham and all of his messages, whenever he would preach, he would hold his Bible up, and you would hear him repeatedly say, 
And the Bible says. Did he not? I love that about Billy Graham. He didn't say this is what Billy Graham says. Or this is what somebody else says. He would say. And the Bible says. And he'd quote the scripture. I want you to know. Orville Baptist Church has been. And shall always be a church. That preaches the word. Now where did we get that from? Well I'm glad you asked. Look again at that scripture. Uh, in which it says, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' what? Teaching. That's the word of God. Those disciples taught and preached the word of God. What Jesus taught them. Now listen carefully. It's more than just preaching about the Bible. There is a difference between a preacher preaching about the Bible and preaching the Bible. Uh, it's important that the Scripture speaks for itself. Now, in college and seminary, there was a term for that. We called it exegesis. And when a pastor or a teacher would teach and preach exegetical, he would actually be preaching that which God put in the Word in the context of the Bible itself and not arbitrarily pull out one verse and make it say whatever he wanted to say. Now, in contrast, we heard another term in college and seminary. It was the word eisegesis. Eisegesis is reading into the Scripture... That which is not part of the scripture. So one of the most important things a pastor can do is preaching exegetical the word. What's in the Bible and not stray from what thus saith the Lord. And it's important that you and I understand that a true church should be a Bible-based church preaching the Word. If it's Bible-based, it'll be, as someone well said, Bible-preached and blessed. Paul said to Timothy in 2 Timothy 4.2, Preach the Word. So when you and I come in on a Sunday morning, while we might have different problems and different needs, primarily you don't come in here saying, Preacher, I want you to focus on my need. No, I'm going to focus on worshiping God, and I'm going to focus on preaching His Word, and when I do that, I promise you, whatever problem you have, whatever need you have, God can address it through the preaching of His Word. You'll be surprised when you come into the house of God, how the Holy Spirit will take the preach Word of God, and all of a sudden a light will come on, and you say, man, this is exactly what I needed to hear today. Rather than come in and say, I hope He'll address my felt needs. You see, one of the problems we're having today in America in a lot of churches, people want to come and they want that pastor to tickle their ears and they want them, they say, well, address my needs. I want to feel good, preacher. Make me feel good. Well, that's not my primary responsibility. My, prim my primary responsibility is to glorify God and preach His Word. Now, listen, if you're lining up with God's Word, you're going to feel pretty good. If you're not lining up with His Word, you're not going to feel so good. And one old guy said, you know, sometimes my toes get stepped on. Any, anybody ever had their toes stepped on? Now look, I had one old boy. I had one old boy. He, he felt like he, he wasn't in a church unless he got his toes stepped on all the time. I said, man, you, you're, not, you're going to be decapitated, man. If I step on your toes all the time, you're not going to have any feet to walk around on. I told him, I said, Tom, sometimes God does need to step on our toes. The Bible, he says, is given for correction. How many of us need from time to time to be corrected? Sure. He said the Bible is given for reproof. Sometimes we need to be reproved. But if I'm always correcting, reproving, not me but God, and not encouraging you, then I'm out of balance. So when you come in here, the Bible will either make you glad, sad, or mad. And that's the truth. I mean, that's a simple way of looking at it. But these early Christians in the early church were committed and devoted to 100% the preaching of God's Word. And so must 
Orville Church continue to preach, thus saith the Lord. Here's a second thing I want you to notice. It's a church that does what? Promotes the fellowship. Promotes the fellowship. Look at the verse. Now all the believers were together. And by the way, I want to thank my wife for her timely suggestion. She said sometimes our folks not sure when they need to chime in. And she said, why don't you just put what you want them to say in a different color on the thing and just point at them. So thank you, Sandy. So when you see a different color, let me, and I pause, that's your part. I'm just going to point at you. That way you don't, you got it? I, you, all right. So now all the believers were together. And they had everything in common. And it says, and every day they devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple. And they broke bread from house to house. And they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart. Now, you notice the two words that were in both of those verses that were common. What were the two words that I put in yellow? What were they? S say it again. Together. Now, what is the word fellowship in the Greek really mean? It is the word, you've heard it before, koinonia. Not a hard word to learn. Let's see if you can say that with me. Ready? Koinonia. Say it again. Koinonia. Well, what does that mean, Pastor? I don't have study Greek, you say. It simply means this, to have everything in common. Now, when they talked about fellowship, they were not talking in terms of sipping coffee and Kool-Aid and Cokes and sitting down eating together. That was not what it talked about. Let me kind of illustrate it for you. I, as some of you know, and now today all of you will know, that I have always been a diehard UK basketball fan. I grew up in eastern Kentucky, and we bleed blue. And that is such a common, common thing that runs throughout Kentucky, although we have our rival as Louisville Cardinals, and some people bleed red, but a good group of us, blue. And anywhere I go in America, or internationally for that reason, if I ever see a person that has a UK logo, the colors and the UK, I automatically know I have something in common with them. And I can gravitate, and I do gravitate toward them and begin to have a conversation. My wife can attest to that. She said, man, there's no strangers when it comes to UK. If i got a hat on and somebody else has got what's in the airport, all of a sudden we're sitting down for 30 minutes chatting. Just like we've known each other all of our life. Why? Because we have something in common that we're passionate about. Now listen to me, folks. The fellowship of the church means you and I are passionate and have in common the most important thing that draws us together from various backgrounds, uh, that draws us together, that we have in common, and we're passionate about, and that we consider ourselves family. And that is Jesus Christ. Chances are most of us in this auditorium and those watching online would have never chosen to break bread and fellowship with each other. Because we all have different personalities, different likes, different things. What chance would there have been that you and I would have chosen intentionally to hang out together? No. No. But you see, the high, the mighty, the rich, the poor, the black, the white, it doesn't matter across the spectrum. A child of God is drawn together to be part of the family with other children of God. And we, the Bible says, love one another. It was in 1992 after... The communism fell that I had the opportunity and Sandy joined me later on in 98 when we went to Ukraine. I, 92 I had a chance to go to Moscow and Russia and spend 10-12 days on a mission trip there. And I want you to know uh, what a wonderful experience that was and I, I took away from that uh, trip so many positive things. Number one just to be able to see how those lived in Russia 
and how wonderful those people were. And you, you begin to see the facade of Russia come down. And you realize that they weren't everything they were cracked up to be that they tried to portray. But one of the things I noticed about those folks is they enjoyed conversing with you. And we had the opportunity to visit two or three churches as well as going into a prison and doing some ministry and some orphanages. I'll never forget on the second day that we were there, we went to a very small church building wise. But I'm going to tell you, that building was probably a a fourth of what this building is, this sanctuary. But I'm going to tell you something. It was packed out. Packed out. The deacons, my deacons, let me tell you, guess where they sat? They sat right up front or on the platform with the pastor. And it wasn't an hour you're in and out. They had time to worship God. Sometimes their services were three hours. But they enjoyed it, enjoyed fellowship with one another. I fell in love with those dear folks. And I remember when we left that day and got on the bus to go to our next stop. i never forget these little ladies that were in that congregation that day. Of course, you'd come in as a lady, you have to wear a scarf. They believe that you've got to keep your head covered for ladies. And so they would not take those scarves off their head until they exited the building. We loaded up. And all of those people came out and those ladies removed their headdress, their scarf, and started waving at us. And they started singing in Russian, God be with you till we what? Meet again. And while they were singing in Russia, we were singing in English the same song. There wasn't a dry eye on that bus. And I'll never forget pulling away and out from that parking lot, watching those dear ladies wave and singing that song. And I thought to myself, you're right, we, we'll never see you in all probability ever, ever again down here until we meet again up there. And when I left, look at me. I said, there's my family. These are my sisters and brothers in Christ. And I was so moved. I had never met them before until that day. All of a sudden, I had a kindred fellowship and family heart with those family members. Why? It was Jesus who brings us together. And someday, ladies and gentlemen... All the family of God from all walks of life from time immemorial will be there in heaven fellowshipping together. And we're just getting a little taste of it when we come to church and we fellowship. Why we come in here and want to see one another, hug one another, shake hands with one another, encourage one another. Because we believe in the fellowship. And Orville Baptist Church has promoted the fellowship of the saints throughout her 122 years. And many of you dear saints have been here obviously a lot longer than me. You have many stories of those days in fellowship with previous members that you're looking forward to seeing them again. Isn't that right? Loved ones. Fellowship. And now I want you to see the third as we move on quickly before we wrap this up. Not only does preaches the word and promotes the fellowship, well, I want you to see this. I want you to see something that Lyndon is trying to do with the choir and the congregation, and you're starting to see him do it. He says things like, smile, sing, lift up the name of Jesus. Did he not say that in that first song? We're here to celebrate Jesus. And so the third uh, ingredient there is a church that praises the Lord. And let's look at that scripture. What does it say? Praising God and having favor with all people. Well, what does it mean by praising God? Look, when you come to church, and I come to church in the house of God, the object of worship 
is God. He's, he's watching. And it's not about us, it's about Him. And we want to make sure that when we come into the house of God, we get a little bit excited about singing about God. Uh, I mean, there, there are so many people that come to church and they just frown. They get out of bed and look like they've been baptized in lemon juice. I used to think that as a little boy at First Baptist Church when I attended in Sunday school and I got to the point where I no longer wanted to come to church. I was not a believer and my mother made me go and, and when I got to be an eighth grader and move into ninth grade, church was not my cup of tea. But I would always say, you know, on a Sunday I'd be downtown doing something, running around and I'd watch some of these folks at First Baptist Church come out of the service at 12 o'clock sharp. And like old Vance Havner used to say, some churches start at 11 o'clock sharp and they end 12 o'clock dull. Well, you'll get that after a while. And I would think, I'd watch these folks come out of the church. And they just looked like they had the worst time. They looked like they were in so much pain and agony. And I said, man, if that's what church does for you, leave me out of it. I want to have fun. Now, is God opposed to us in having fun and enjoyment in church? Heavens, no. He wants you and he wants me to be a little bit more excited. I want our worship services to be filled with praising people, praising God. I heard uh, about the story uh, uh, of a church of somebody who was driving out to Montana. And it was really in an extreme remote area. And they, the couple got lost and... They drove around trying to figure out where they were. They finally came up on the, somebody who was at a crossroad gas station. And the man got out and he came over to the guy and he looked at the barren surroundings and went in. And then he looked at that store owner who was sitting there in the chair outside, rocking chair, smoking a corn cob pipe. And so he looks at this man and he says, Mr. What do you do around here for excitement? To which the man replied, Buddy, around here we don't get excited. <laughs> well, I think that's true of a lot of churches. We don't get excited. Well, what, are you, what, are you, what are you getting excited for? You've heard me say this before. I'll say it again. Some of us get more thrilled and more excited about a ball game than we do coming to church. I've seen it. I've seen sometimes you can't get that individual to open its mouth or get excited or smile, but boy, you get them out on a stadium on a Saturday, they're rocking and rolling. I don't have a problem with that. Well, listen, God is someone who to get more excited about than a ball game. By the way, before we look at our last point, do you know where the word enthusiasm comes from? The root word of enthusiasm is the word entheo. Theo is the word for God. When you study theology, it's the study of God. Entheo means in God. That's why a person who is enthused needs to understand if you are in God, you're enthused. And he makes you want to come to church and makes you make it a priority. And when you come, you praise God and say, hey, I'm here and this is exciting. And I want this atmosphere to be true in my life. Don't want to be a, belong to a dead church. About maybe like that 85-year-old woman who got a blind date with a 95-year-old man. The daughter was very concerned because she had heard about this 95-year-old man. So he, even at 95, can be a little frisky. So she warned her mama said, you be careful and don't let this man get too frisky with you. And they went on the date and he, they came in and she came in rather late. She didn't show up from the date till one o'clock in the morning. The daughter asked her if she had a good time. <laughs> she said, no. In fact, I had to slap this man three times. And the daughter said, did he try to get frisky with you? And she said, heavens no, I thought he was dead. <laughs> well, sometimes we need to slap one another around so we get excited. Uh, praising God. 
I think God would be happy with that, don't you? He's deserving of all of our worship. And by the way, when you get to heaven, you're not going to be frowning up there, are you? You think you're going to sit back there and fold your little hands and just... No, there's going to be excitement. There's going to be singing. There's going to be enthusiasm. So let's practice it down here. Well, here's the final thing. Not only praising the Lord, but lastly, a church that does what? Proclaims the gospel. Notice what it says in verse 41 and 47. Well, in verse 47, and every day the Lord added to them those who were being saved. Being saved. Verse 41 says those who received his word were baptized. And the Lord was adding people to the church. Don't miss two things about how the Lord did that work. Number one, on the one hand, the Lord did not add any person to the church without saving them first. You see, the church is made up of people who are saved. And then the Lord didn't save secondly and add people to salvation unless he uh, added them to the church. So, save people belong to the church. And the church is a place where they join to serve their Lord. And the Lord was adding to the church. Aren't you glad when, he starts, when we start seeing additions in the church? How many of you... Get excited when somebody comes down the aisle and gives their life to Christ and makes a decision. Doesn't that, doesn't that kind of just turn things around? So we, we are church and have been for 122 years preaching the gospel, letting people know how to be saved, how to know Christ. That's why Jesus said, go, the Great Commission, go and make disciples. We need to say, God, add to Orville Baptist Church in her future souls that will come into the kingdom. And ladies and gentlemen, we certainly need that. I'm looking forward to the day as we continue to proclaim the gospel. Listen, when we say proclaim the gospel, we're not only talking about telling people in the church how to be saved, but when we leave these doors on Sunday, we need to proclaim the gospel to people outside the church on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday and Saturday. We are His messengers. And we must not keep the good news of the gospel to ourselves.